Hello, this is Howard Rheingold. I taught at Berkeley and Stanford from 2005 to 2015 using uh, what are now called social media to teach about issues around social media. And uh, I thought it, it, it would be useful right now to talk about um, my journey. Uh, of course, I chose to use social media. Now so many uh, teachers are being forced to teach online. So uh, a lot of what I learned might be helpful to you. Uh, as I said, my experience was with college students. And um, I also taught a purely online course called Rheingold U that had a wide uh, range of uh, ages, uh, uh, people in different countries. And uh, it's, as far as I know, what, what I'm saying pertains uh, to higher education, but it, it could well be applied to high school uh, level as well. And I don't really claim any expertise at, at uh, levels uh, lower than that. I want to emphasize that um, I'm talking about technology, but it's within, in a context of a, a certain kind of pedagogy and that uh, you, you could do this face to face with whiteboards and, and, and post-its and, and index cards. But uh, if you're teaching online, um, I, I want to try to distinguish it among some of the, the tools that you can use and, and what I use them for. Two, two things I learned is uh, it's important to trust students. Uh, for every uh, slacker and cheater that you catch by not trusting them, um, you've given the message to the, the rest of the students, the, you know, 10 or 50 of them for every slacker, um, that you don't trust them. Um, I also uh, learned that when I confessed that I was learning to teach while um, I was teaching them and that I uh, welcomed their feedback, that uh, we got into a kind of uh, trusted feedback loop that I ended up calling co-learning. Others have called this a new culture of learning. Uh, there's a book of that name by Douglas Thomas and, and John C. Lee Brown that I recommend. And, and very quickly, the characteristics of the kind of learning they're talking about is that's learner-centered. And of course, uh, most of these you can do without technology. Self-directed, social and peer-to-peer, -peer, inquiry based, collaborative and cooperative. And I distinguish those uh, by by collaborative uh, being working together on projects and cooperative being helping each other learn. Networked. And then this is what my first uh, classroom looked like at, at UC Berkeley. And uh, there were some changes in the classroom I'll talk about a little bit later. So I started out um, by um, using a, a forum uh, from one vendor and a, a blog. Uh, application from another vendor and a wiki from another vendor. And, and the students uh, complained uh, quite correctly that these all had separate logins and separate user interfaces. So I, I entered a competition and, and won a small award that I used uh, to pay a developer to create uh, what I call the social media classroom. And uh, you'll see these uh, colored uh, tabs at the top of the page. Uh, by clicking on wiki, you go to the wiki. By clicking on forums, you go to the forums. So you can switch back and forth uh, very easily within a, a single web page. Um, so this is, uh, this is the forum. And I think of the forum as a place for the voice of the group. Um, you know, you have a face-to-face -face, uh, conversation and then the bell rings. Well, you can continue that. Um, in the in the face-to-face -face world um, online. Um, if you're doing it purely online, um, this is really the place where you and your learners um, decide what it is you want to continue to discuss from, from your, your syllabus and, and, and from their interests. Um, there's also blogs. Um, if the, the forum is the, the voice of the group, then the, the blog is really the voice of the individual. And I think using these both together uh, gives an opportunity for uh, people to explore the subject as a class and to reflect on their own 
learning personally and to talk to each other about their reflections. Uh, we also used a wiki. Uh, there are other collaborative uh, writing apps like Google Docs is one that, that probably most students know. And uh, I'll talk about an application we used for collaborative collaborative learning a little later. We also used social bookmarks, which was built into the social media classroom. But of course, uh, there's a social bookmarking service like Digo that enables you to, to do that and to uh, create a group. You could create a group for your classroom in Digo and um, bookmark things for each other. And uh, you can also highlight and leave sticky notes. There are a lot of different tools that you can use. Um, one, uh, another one that's newer is Hypothesis that you can use for um, group annotation. And I think any of these tools can be useful if the, if the students take to it. And there's, I think, some advantage to trying out a number of them and seeing which work the best. That's what I did. So this is how it started out. And, um, and two changes happened that radically changed the way we taught. One was we, we moved the, the chairs in a circle. And another thing that came from our co-learning experience was that the, the, the students themselves started helping me teach. Uh, we selected uh, uh, teams of three students and they would come up with a plan and I would consult with them and they would lead about a third of the class um, and found that they were enthusiastic about it. There's nothing like teaching something to, to learn it, but also the experience of standing up and, and trying to maintain the attention of all the other students um, in the face of the entire internet at, at their fingertips it is a good experience for students to have. Um, so one of the things we used the, the wiki for was the lexicon. One of the things that the co-teaching teams did was that they identified words and phrases from the texts, from my lectures, from our discussions, and they put them on a wiki page. And then the, the entire class, including myself and the co-teaching team would, would fill out the definitions, kind of the way Wikipedia works. And at the end of the term, we had quite a, a useful lexicon. Um, I also asked them to make mind maps. That, that was one of the things that each co-teaching team, and I, I like mind maps because they're visual, because they're lateral, because they show connections between things. Um, so just quickly, you know, you don't have to have a, a fancy application to do it. You can do it with pen and, and paper and take a photograph. And you can see students came up with a lot of different um, ways to, to mind map what we had been talking about. I also presented the material in a number of different ways. So I presented the syllabus as a wiki. Um, I also um, made it as a uh, concept map. Um, all, all of these are clickable here. And also as a Prezi. Um, and then, as I, I mentioned, um, aside from my teaching at Berkeley and Stanford, I also taught a, a course online uh, that I called Rheingold U. So I experimented a lot and, and learned a great deal about how to use these things. We also had uh, live video conference sessions. Um, so this is a, a screenshot from um, Blackboard Collaborate. This is years before Zoom was available. And I'm recording this in uh, an app called Big Blue Button that I think is very uh, useful for, for learning as well. I discovered, and I think this is really useful at whatever level you are teaching, if you are teaching through video conference, um, instead of talking at the students, um, why not include them as active participants? So we came up with roles together and uh, two or three people would volunteer to be searchers who would search for uh, useful resources that were relevant to what we were talking about. And they would put the URLs in the, in the text chat. And then there were um, contextualizers who would take those URLs and write one or two or three uh, lines describing them. Um, summarizers who would summarize the text chat that acted as a back channel. Well, while we were speaking on, on, on video. Um, then there would be the curators who would take the summaries and the contextualized URLs um, and the link to the mind maps and the lexicon and, and create a wiki page 
so that each live session had a wiki page with all that information that people could go back to or people who missed it could could look at. Um, there was a lexicon team and a mind mapping team uh, as well. And uh, I encouraged uh, learners to take different roles uh, every time. We would often do mind maps together online and there are a number of shared whiteboards that uh, enable you to do that. And my favorite was a shared whiteboard um, that Blackboard Collaborate had uh, in which people could participate anonymously. So you would just see things appearing on the page and moving around and I use it in my, my very first session and it, it really works to kind of um, give people the, the understanding that they can act online uh, collectively as a kind of collective intelligence. Well, I began to uh, do my own online teaching when I, I saw around, oh, gee whiz, it was around 2010. There were more and more websites popping up for, for people to, to learn from without school. So I, I asked myself, what's next? Um, I gave a lecture at uh, UC Berkeley in, in which I, I talked at greater length about my journey. And then I talked about what might it be like if we eliminated the teacher entirely? What if a group of, of learners want to learn a particular subject and none of them is an expert in that subject? How, how do you find and qualify and organize resources? Um, uh, how do you teach each other? Uh, we had some face-to-face -face sessions at the Berkeley Center for New Media with graduate students and, and teachers. Um, we had uh, online forums in between those sessions. And uh, I had my laptop at the session and had a video conference open. And what happened was that educators from around the world began to participate. And, um, and eventually we decided on a number of uh, online media and created an, a pedagogy handbook, pedagogy being the word that we came up for, for peer learning. And we were really kind of an example of what we were talking about in the sense that, uh, that we learned which media to use and, and what roles to take and how to do it. And in fact, um, if you go to uh, pedagogy.org, you will find a, a free peer-to-peer -peer learning handbook. I uh, kind of stepped back from this group after two years, but since then they have organized quite effectively a community of, of uh, educators from US, Mexico, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Brazil, and, uh, and they're, I think, on the fifth revision of the, the handbook. And they welcome uh, any educators who want to join them. I learned uh, in the last years of my teaching college students uh, what's called open learning. Uh, the, the first example of that was something called DS106, uh, DS standing for digital storytelling, in which they created blogs for each student, and then they created a, a hub using WordPress that syndicated all of the blog posts together. And they also created filters so that students could only interact with those in their course, or they could interact with students who had taken the course before, and it was also open to anybody in the world. So you could choose um, who you wanted to learn with. Um, so I changed my uh, teaching and uh, asked my students before our first meeting to um, use a, a very uh, useful service called Reclaim Hosting that for $25 would give them a domain name and access to their own uh, slice of server um, for a year. And uh, they would uh, be able to install and configure their own WordPress. Um, it's not just about expressing yourselves. It's about learning how to be your own publisher, not rely on, um, on Facebook as being the only way to, to, to publish. Um, so uh, each student had a blog, and then we had, uh, you know, they had their individual blogs, which they could continue to use after the, the course. Um, we used uh, MediaWiki as well, and for a forum, we used Discourse, which is, uh, I recommend, discourse.org. Um, 
And um, the, the result uh, of that was that, uh, that students began taking more and more responsibility. I, I wish I had the, the, the nerve or the knowledge uh, earlier to do what I did uh, toward the very end. Um, the last time I taught uh, a course at, at Stanford, after our, our second meeting and the students knew what was involved and had al always, already been involved in the forum and the, and the blogs and, and the wiki and, and all of the, the uh, instruments that I've described to you, I, I wrote on the, on the whiteboard um, everything that was required of them, the blog posts, the, the forum posts, the uh, collaborative writing, the co-teaching, the, the lexicon. And, uh, and then I wrote my phone number on the board and I said, uh, I'm going to leave and uh, you're going to figure out um, how you would like to uh, take this course and, uh, and, and correct my syllabus uh, on the whiteboard. You can text me if you have questions. And when you're finished, um, let me let me know, and I'll, I'll come back. And I did come back, and they had had changed it all around, and we we worked with that for the rest of the the quarter, and it worked pretty well. Um, in an ideal world, I would meet with with uh, learners uh, for a week or two before we began, and we would co-create the syllabus uh, together. Uh, Kathy Davidson, when she was uh, teaching uh, courses at Duke. Uh, was quite successful uh, with doing that. So uh, I guess in, in, in closing, I would, would say um, it's important to, to let the students know that, that we've all been thrown into this circumstance together and we're all learning how to do it together and uh, that you as the teacher value their input about what works and what doesn't work and, and also um, to give the students more and more responsibility for their learning and and reflecting on their learning um, in public. And um, in the end, uh, instead of having a final exam, um, what what I did was ask them to take the, the, the blog posts and the forum posts and the, the wiki work and the co-teaching that they had done uh, during the, the term and, and create some kind of document in any medium um, that told the story of what they had learned about the subject. And, uh, and I found that to be um, amazingly uh, creative. It really uh, cut loose their creativity. So uh, again, to, to recap, um, there are a lot of different technologies. A lot of uh, teachers are just using Zoom or uh, other video conferencing and presenting lectures. Uh, I learned not to lecture for more than five or 10 minutes at a time before taking a break and, and having conversations. And it, it's, it's really distancing to just look at your screen and, and listen for hours at a, a time. Um, have your students uh, participate. Enlist them in helping you come up with new ways to participate, Ex experiment. Uh, and uh, you, you do have a certain amount of material that you need to get across, but there are a lot of different ways to do that. And, and in my experience, mixing asynchronous media, such as blogs and forums, with synchronous media, such as uh, video conferencing, uh, often with a um, text back channel, really works uh, a lot better than, than keeping it strictly synchronous. So if, uh, if you want to learn more, I've got a lot of material at wrangle.com. There's a, a tab that says learning. I, I have more than 100 interviews um, with uh, innovators in digital media and learning. I, I'm also uh, on Twitter and Patreon. So I welcome any questions that you might have about this. Good luck and have fun.